Remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your hearts how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scripture says, they shall freely, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy and perfect word. Many of you may know that Newberry Town is older than the United States. It was founded in about uh, 1741 by the Quakers. Uh, most records indicate that about 1803 people began to meet for church services located in what was called uh, Newberry Commons at that time. I guess it still is called that, the little area that's not too far from the old church. And eventually uh, congregations began to form. And that God had always had a presence in Newberry Town. And it was on the very first day of February in the year 1857 that the Newberry Town Church of God uh, became a congregation. Tomorrow, that will mean that 164 years have been celebrated by people who started that congregation. And in that time, how many lives have been touched? How many people came to be a part of God's kingdom? And how many more, because of what they did in the past, will come to know Jesus in the future? It got me thinking. This summer, hopefully, will be the Olympics. I know it was supposed to be last year, but they rescheduled it for this year. And one of the events that they have there is the 400-meter relay. You know, they get the fastest people in the world who each run 100 meters, and they, and they hand off the baton to the next runner who then sprints. And that race is usually determined, of course, in those two factors. How fast you are in running to the next runner, but also in handing off that baton. If either one of those two things fail, probably you're not going to be successful in winning that race. This congregation so far has been quite successful in handing off that baton. Because the average church in the United States lasts about 40 years. That's the length of the average congregation. So that means that in Newburytown we're over four times older than the average uh, congregation has been. That means that in the past, someone has been successful in passing that baton on to the next runner. And so tomorrow, or today, I guess we celebrate that 164 years of wonderful ministry, of weddings and funerals, of worship and song, of fellowship and Bible study, youth group, giving, preaching, teaching. But as that has continued, we must be preparing as we at some point will hand that baton on to those who will come after us. And as we run the race, we must be going as fast as we can, yet looking to hand that baton off. Are we, as we run that race, giving it our best effort or have at sometimes we slowed down, lessened our pace? Or are we running the race that we have been called to run? When we look back at our history, we know that there have been people who have done things for decades in order to get where we are today. There have been some who have been attending this church here today for decades. Others who have been attending for just a few months. Either way, we know that if you're here today, we have been blessed by your presence, blessed by your gifts, your generosity, your talents. We have with us people who are very gifted in music and in song, people who are very generous in their giving, people who are hard workers for the Lord, people who have hearts that want others to come to know uh, Jesus, and people that won't hesitate to help others in need. We have been blessed in that way, and we are grateful for your generosity and kindness in that way. 
as a church, we want to have opportunities where we know it's hard in the time of COVID in order to share that message with those who are around us. We know that there are people around the world, actually, who sometimes turn into the sermon weekly, at least in India and Africa and other uh, places. And sometimes we might have a tendency to look at the things that we've done for the length of time that we've been able to do them. And maybe sometimes we wish to pause and to even pat ourselves on the back. But God has never called us to compare ourselves with others. He's only asked us to compare ourselves with what he has asked us to do in this moment of time. What is he asking us to do? And are we being obedient and faithful? As as Sue said in her prayer request, to listen to God and then to obey him and do what he asks us to do, to discover his plan because he already has the plan. Our job is to help discover what his plan is and do it. You see, but one of the great challenges we have is to continue to foster getting closer to him and then having the ability to share his plan with those who are around us. I'm not talking about a faith in just church culture or faith in faith, but the ability to know and comprehend who Jesus is and to pass that on our need for Jesus. Because what this world needs, what the next generation needs, what every human being needs is more Jesus. If we know Jesus, then we will be right. A relationship that must be built on trust and obedience. Are we willing to do that? Because I don't want to be a congregation that just wants to keep the doors open to remember a past, but to prepare for a future. A future of one that is following God. We need Jesus in 2021, and we need Jesus for the future realities that are to come. To Him, keep Him our first love. See, Jesus is inviting us to the same mission that He had, that He gave His very first disciples. Come and be a part of the pursuit of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God to build the greatest thing that is ever known, to restore human relationships with God and with each other, to be reconciled. You see, the only thing that's going to last that we interact with on a consistent basis is other people. And their destiny is so important. That God has given to us this moment in time. What are we going to do with it? What are we going to use it for? To share Jesus with those around us. See, every single one of us has been allotted a certain amount of time. And what will we do with that time? That choice is up to us. In the same way that we, as individuals, have been allotted that time. Congregations have been allotted that time as well. To which God has gifted to them. What will they do with the time that is given to them? Too often, I fear that many of us have at various moments of our lives chosen to pursue things of lesser importance than the kingdom of God. But when we do, God does not scorn us or chastise us much. He just invites us to get back up, to refocus, and to get back on the important mission of pursuing His kingdom. Nothing, though, my friends, will rob us from that mission quicker than having the eyes of the world, pursuing the things that the world thinks is important, things like uh, materialism. Sometimes I hear people say things like, I can't really give of my time or my talent or especially uh, you know, my money because I don't have any right now. Well, giving money doesn't start when we walk in the church door. It starts way before that. Why we don't have money to give is we have to ask ourselves, what kind of car do I drive? What kind of place do I live? What do I spend money on for entertainment and clothes? And see, if if God's always at the end of the list and he just gets the scrap of whatever's left over, it's always going to be a scrap. But if we think God gets off the top first, what God needs is most important, well then it's always going to be most important. And I know that takes faith, but God is good. And he will be faithful because the truth is that God will be far more faithful to us than we have been to him. Trust and obey. Trust in the people that God has appointed that you've elected as leaders. Because if we are leaders in the church, anyone that's here, they have an accountability. Every dollar that goes into that offering plate is an accountability of what did we use it for? That we will stand before God. Did we use it in the best possible means? See, our job is to give, then to trust the people that have been entrusted with that money and for them to seek the wisdom to use it in the best possible means. 
God is so good. See, sometimes we think I need more resources, I need more time, I need more money. No, we mean more obedience and more grace. That's what we need, obedience and grace. If we truly grow in God, then we understand that growing in God means we receive more of God's generosity, more of His grace, and as we receive that, that is echoed in our lives. And as we pursue generosity, as we pursue grace, then God blesses that. You see, a church begins to decline when it begins to think like the world. When it begins to think about certain markers or things that it needs to mark like it is their business. But the truth is that a church is successful to the degree that it echoes God's grace and generosity back to Him. God has been generous. He will always be generous. And it is our obligation to be generous back to Him. You see, God gave us this building. That is how generous God is. Today, there's a plaque that hangs out there. It was hung two weeks ago, but you might want to take note as you enter into the welcome area. And that plaque reads the following words. This building is a miracle from God. We give all glory and praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who loved us, gave us this house of worship as a gift. We dedicate the use of this building to the Lord Jesus Christ. God gave us this building. I know that we contributed, we worked, we did things, but largely we must give God the praise and glory. It is by His grace that we have this building. He has been so kind and generous. What will we do with God's kindness and generosity? Do so often we think in our minds, I, I need to hoard this a little bit. I need to prepare it. I mean not to save it. We're like that parable where we think, I'll just bury it in the ground. I'll keep it safe. Nothing bad will happen to it until which time I give it back up. And then here it is back. God doesn't want us to just keep it safe, just preserve it like a museum. He wants us to use it. That's why he gave it to us. It must be used by him. And so today I ask, what ministry what purpose what agenda has god laid upon your heart that he's asking you to be involved in and then collectively we are involved in to seek him he's asking us as romans 12 says to be a living sacrifice for him what does that mean it means that everything you are everything you will ever be belongs to him your time your money your mind your resources your will they belong to god and we submit to him and we say god you're the boss and I want to dedicate my life to you. I want to give my money to you. I want to give my time. I want to give my talents to you. But we will only understand those things to the degree that we listen to God. And we cannot listen to someone unless we are close to them. And the only way to get close to God is pray, to read his word, and to grow in an ever-deepening pursuit of him. You see, God wishes us to be generous because he has always been generous. That is his heart. That is his nature. And he asked that we were just reflect the generosity, just a portion of that generosity back to him. The blessings and kindness that he has bestowed upon every one of our lives. I remember when I came here just the week before is when I found out we didn't have a building anymore in town. And that was pretty shocking to some people. There was, I don't think I have to remind you, there was a little bit of chaos and confusion, concern about uh, what all was going on. And of course, I don't have all the answers, but God did. But I knew in the calmness of those things, the most important thing was to seek Him. And even no matter how stressful it got, I never forgot in the back of my mind, God's calming influence of saying, it is going to be okay. I didn't know whether we were going to have a building right away. I didn't know how long it would be. I didn't know what God would do, but I knew that God would be faithful. And he was faithful. And if we don't remember that and to share that generosity and faithfulness of others, God will just give it or use someone else. But he has gifted us this opportunity to use and to bless others. See, Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. That's how much he loved us. That's how generous he is. And if that fact alone doesn't remind us of the great generosity of God and that it reminds us of our need to be generous back to him, that everything that he has given to us, even the opportunity to have eternal life, to save me from the punishment that I earned, if I can't respond to God by saying, then God, take whatever you need from me. Let me be used by you in whatever way. I don't know what else to say. Because God has been so good 
and he has been so good to us that we should seek him more than anything else in this world. This congregation of which we are immensely glad to be a part of that has been here now 164 years, four times longer than the average congregation in these, in these United States has been blessed. But it has been blessed because it was full of people who pursued God, who had a desire to seek God. I would like this congregation to be here for another 164 years. But that will only happen to the degree that people have made a decision, that they say, I will pass that baton on. I will pursue Jesus. I will run this race. I will love God more than others. I wish to build his kingdom. I wish to seek his revival. I want to understand his heart. And the ability to which we do that, we will be successful in enduring as a body. Let that be our focus, because all congregations will last only as long as God desires. But God will desire any church to last that wishes to love and to serve Him. Let us pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for our mothers and our fathers. We thank you for the people that came before us in our faith. We thank you for the vision, the faith, and the obedience that you gave to those who were in Newberry Town in 1857 that they would begin this church, this congregation, on February the 1st of that year. We are blessed by their prayers. Their prayers which echo through the years and are still reflected on us today. We pray that we would also echo their obedience, their prayers, that a hundred years from now, people would still remember what we did and the influence it had on where they are. Father, we thank you again for the faithfulness of those who have gone before us, who served this congregation in the last 164 years. We thank you for the great generosity that they have shown, and we thank you for the generosity that will be shown in the future. Father God, I ask that you would give us hearts that wish to seek you above all else, that you would prepare us for the work that you have planned us to do, that you help flame the fire of revival here in Newberry Town and beyond, that we would have an awakening in our hearts and minds that would spread throughout our nation and this world. Humble us that, may be, that we may be used by you. Make us hunger and thirst for your word and for prayer. Help us to want a deepening relationship with you and give us the work that you would have us do and the faith that we would be obedient to you that others may know you as Savior and Lord. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.